This is Forbidden Speech: The Raw Truth with your host Christina Rivera. In this savvy broadcasting series, we delve into hot topics affecting us all. With cancel culture and big tech censoring any opposing ideas and thoughts outside of mainstream ideology, it has become more important than ever that we tell the raw truth about everything from U.S. world politics, COVID, Christianity, and everything in between. We invite all points of view to come and share their perspective honestly and respectfully. <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> Doctor Hugh McTavish, welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, uh, Forbidden Speech: The Raw Truth. We're so grateful to have you here today. We're hitting on a a really interesting topic we've not covered on Savvy, and and that is a proposal you have that would really restore the power back to the people. That really was what our representatives in the Senate and the governorship and the Congress were supposed to be. They were supposed to be talking on behalf of all the people. It's kind of gotten. Topsy turvy. Well, now the people in much of the government thinks that uh, we work for them. Uh, don't speak up, little people. Sit down. And even seeing some of the local councils where people come forth and speak, sit down. Your time's over, Mister Nobody. I'm like, have they forgotten that we vote them in and not the other way around? Well, I'm so grateful.、Uh, you are the Minnesota uh, governor. Uh, you're going to run for governorship,、uh, a candidate、uh, for the Independent Alliance Party. And bring forth a wonderful proposal that should hopefully more restore the power back to the people. I'd love if you would share a little bit about your backstory first, and then what prompted you to run, and this wonderful proposal.、Uh, thank you.、Um, <clears throat> so、uh, my my background is uh, uh, well, I've got a got a PhD in biochemistry and、uh, a patent law degree, and so I've been a patent lawyer and a biochemist、uh, for. All my life, or, or whatever, last last since I was since I was twenty or thirty or so, and、um, uh, the uh, and along the way, I started two pharmaceutical companies,、uh, IGF Oncology,、uh, with a targeted drug to treat cancer, and Squarex to with a、uh, drug that prevents cold sores,、hmm. and both of those were my own inventions, actually. Uh, uh, and I'm still the CEO of those two companies, and now I'm running for governor of Minnesota. I wrote, I, I wrote,、uh, I've written three books.、Um, uh, the most recent was COVID Lockdown Insanity,、uh, which、uh, argues that the lockdown response to COVID was was could be considered clinically insane, I guess, <laughs> but was the 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 res- that caused vastly more harm、mm-hmm. than benefit. Uh, in- Can I stop you real quick? Why do you think the response was like that? Because we've had other such things like、uh, bird flu in, in Queens. We had the Niles West Niles thing, where you know that was because I was living in New York at the time back when that happened. What caused the response that we took for this particular virus? Boy, I don't know. It's I mean, it, it's fruitful. It's fertile ground for conspiracy theories because it <laughs> makes so little sense that. That it really doesn't make sense that the if if the if the real purpose was to prevent COVID deaths,、mm-hmm. um, then our public officials, our public health officials, and our government officials are just incompetent because、mm-hmm. it caused it caused so many. I calculated my book. If the lockdowns prevented two hundred thousand COVID deaths, which they certainly did not, but、mm-hmm. uh, like that'd be a very generous estimate of how many COVID deaths were prevented.、Uh, If they even if they did in the United States, they caused over three hundred through over three hundred people into major clinical depression for every one death we prevented, threw two hundred some kids out of school,、uh, and、um, uh, and actually killed more people than they saved in、mm-hmm. deaths of despair that we caused with the lockdowns, the suicides, drug overdose deaths, alcohol deaths,、mm-hmm. and the other deaths. So. Uh, it's just not even a remotely close call of whether the harms exceeded the benefits. They vastly exceeded the benefits,、mm-hmm. and、um, so yeah. If if the purpose, it's just hard to explain、yeah. uh, uh, why government officials would have done this. Would have been so short sighted to to have done this.、Uh, mm-hmm. It's as though,、um, you know, it it. it It leads one to think the 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 depression, the huge increase in depression, was so predictable、mm-hmm. that either they didn't care about happiness and quality of life, or that was actually the goal. They wanted to get people depressed for some reason,、uh, perhaps because depressed people don't fight back and and uh, uh, are、That's、more、true. compliant. 
Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't have a good explanation. I don't think they're evil people. I don't think our governors are evil people. I don't think Anthony Fauci is an evil person, but uh, it's, it, it's hard to explain why they did this. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think when you get fearful, you're kind of shut off that reason part of your brain. And, and when one part, you know, like say uh, you scream fire in a, in a building, everyone doesn't think to see if there is a fire. They're just like, ah, and start stampeding yeah. each other. Yeah. It's maybe that kind of mindset because you're just so scared that you just start responding and acting instead of thinking through, is this the best course of action? So I'm glad you wrote the book for people to get a better handle on it. So in the future, God forbid, we have any type of situation like that. We don't just run straight for panic and fear. But now you have a, a wonderful proposition that as the governor, you'd like to present to put power back in the seat of more of the people that they can actually rule on things that would actually make their lives better and have more control. How, what does that look like? And, and tell our audience a little bit about that. Uh, my proposal is called jury democracy. And it is that we would have for every, every bill or proposal coming out of government, we would call uh, a statistically valid sample of the population, which is five, actually technically about uh, 385 or more. So about 500 or more people randomly selected from all registered voters to come to our state, our state capital, uh, uh, sit and listen to the arguments and evidence from all sides on, on the particular proposal or bill, just as jurors sit and listen to the evidence from both sides in a civil or a criminal trial. And, um, and everybody gets to present their both sides or all sides get to present their arguments and their evidence. No, no sharp time limits. You got 30 seconds because that's, that's the time limit on a, on a TV ad. Or yeah. you know? <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, and then the jurors also then, I, I think an important part of the process that I want to have is break into small groups of 12 uh, um, from the, the 500 or more and discuss it amongst each other. Uh, <laughs> Tell, tell the other 11 jurors how you think they ought to vote. Tell them, more importantly, perhaps tell them about your life experiences and how this proposal would affect you currently, would have affected mm -hmm. you previously in your life. Um, uh, you know, if we're talking legalization of marijuana, for instance, mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to talk to, 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 talk to some, for, for those jurors who've never smoked pot, it would be interesting to talk to jurors who have and, and why they did it and how it affected them. Um, and uh, um, so anyway, the break into smaller groups, discuss it and then vote by secret ballot. And I would require a 55% majority to pass a proposal, which is outside the 5% margin of error with 500 or more people. So you're guaranteed that it's at least, a, if you get 55%, at least you had a majority if we'd been able to, to, to draw everybody into yeah. the so one way to think of, that I think about this is what would be the perfect form of the ideal form of government? The ideal form of government, I think, would be basically New England town hall democracy or Greek democracy. Everybody, every citizen sits and discusses a proposal and decides on it. Not a flip opinion, mm. never heard anything about it, but you get to discuss it and, and the evidence and, and everybody participates and decides on it. Yeah. And the reason we don't do that basically is we've got our lives to live. So we don't have time to consider every proposal. Uh, and it's also logistically impossible to have 350 million people. Get <laughs> Sit in a Zoom call and go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh so we elect representatives to do that job for us, and it's their full-time job to make those decisions for us. But my with my jury democracy idea, we don't uh, I mean, we don't actually have to elect the representatives. We can randomly select citizens and to do the to serve on a jury on a particular proposal, and you get the same result you would get if everybody got together and considered the same proposal. Well, yeah, I, I like the idea of having actual rep representatives that we vote for that actually go up there and vote on our will. But uh, we've, we've not seen that that much of that happen, that people talk the good game, get up there, say all the perfect yum yum stuff that, oh, yeah, I love that. I'm going to vote for him or her. And then uh, they get into office and don't do any of it. Um, so it, it's become lot topsy turvy. Now, the only concern I had when I heard this proposal is I love the idea, but I know that. Uh, yeah, as you said, Americans are so busy, they're like, well, you know, I don't have time to sit here and listen to arguments. And if I'm picked, well, by darn it, I'm going to try to get out of it because I don't have time to sit there and listen to a bill 
that could take days and days of my time. I'm not getting paid. Um, how do we get people to realize that this affects your everyday life and it behooves you to want to get involved? Well, I would I would not make this mandatory as we do with civil and criminal trusts. I'm not sure it should be mandatory in civil and criminal juries either. But but for this, uh, I would not make it mandatory. So if you don't want to show up and participate, that's fine. Just as it's your right not to vote, mm -hmm. it just means more power for the people who choose to vote, or more power for the people who choose to show up for the jury. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I wouldn't make it mandatory. I would like to pay people. Uh, um, and pay them more than we do. In most cases, I think this should just be probably two days, probably for most things, uh, mm -hmm. one, one day to hear the evidence and um, even, even one day in a lot of cases, but probably in most cases, two days. Uh, complicated things, a budget bill that's 500 pages long or something. Yeah. Uh, it might be a couple of weeks or a week or two. Uh, well, that's what I, I realized looking at some of the bills is that there some of them are crazy long, like 300 pages. And I'm like, ah, and the legal leads is what trips you up. Now, if you have, um, how do you call it? A, um, a, a hearing that comes forth and gives you the evidence. So you don't have to read 300 pages of legal leads and not know what the heck you're reading. That would make it better because you're hearing both sides. Um, but do you know why also the bills are kind of complicated and so long when maybe you're talking on a certain issue? Why isn't it like just one page? Why are they so long? Yeah, that's a good question. I think one of the effects of this would be that laws would become less, less legalistic because you're certainly going to have a better chance of getting the jury to vote for the law you're proposing, the bill you're proposing, mm -hmm. if they can understand it than if they can't understand it when they read it. Uh, and also if it's relatively short than if you're asking them to read 300 pages or something. And so I think we, we would get one topic, uh, some of the state constitutions, I think Minnesota, Minnesota state constitution has a provision that every bill has to be one topic. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is often ignored uh, and not really enforced by the courts mm -hmm. um, because um, and I think in part, in large part, the horse trading of politics. So you, we throw, in what I want, we'll throw in what you want, we'll lump them into one bill, and we can pass that. So it's kind of like a way to, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back, and we'll both do each other a favor instead of just focusing on what we're here to talk about, the one specific issue. Yeah. They're trying to appease both sides. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think you'll get, to the extent you get that, that B doesn't have anything to do with A, with the jury, you'll just say, um, and that most, the nearly every legislator, let's say, supports A but opposes B, or supports mm -hmm. B opposes A, and the majority of the population, one way or the other, um, they should stand on their own merits. And so, let's have a vote on A. Let's have a vote on B. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, one proposal I have in Minnesota is uh, we've got a state law. I don't know if other states are like this. That that police officers and all public employees to fire or discipline them. Uh, the discipline has to go to arbitration. And so it's a problem, it's a problem for police officers because we basically can't fire and discipline any cops. The arbitrators overturn everything almost. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. re literally really have to be charged with murder or manslaughter to be fired. Wow. Uh, um, so I would change that to make that at will and uh, mm -hmm. have the police commissioner and probably the mayor and city council each have the authority to fire or discipline police officers, however, whenever they want, make, make police officers at will employees, uh, mm -hmm. bargain for. Um, well, honestly, I think whenever you're, whatever job you're doing, whether it's teacher, police officer, or corporate worker, if you make a mistake, you should be held accountable for the mistake itself and given reasonable, um, you know, punishment for it. And that doesn't mean you get off scot fee. If you make a mistake, you, you know, whatever the punishment might be for whatever um, mistake you make. Um, so I think that's a great idea because you shouldn't get total immunity just because you happen to be a, a cop. Yeah. So yeah. And, and so, so on cops, my view is it's not so, it's not really that we need more or fewer cops. We probably mm -hmm. need more because of the crime. It's gone up yeah. crime lately, <laughs> lately, but Mostly, we just need better cops. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, and we need, and the best way to do that is fire the bad ones. It's not to, not to try to retrain the bad ones, send them to another mm. diversity training seminar to teach them, no, you should not beat up black people. <laughs> or beat up anyone, <laughs> period. No, I've seen a little a kid on the street. It, it was a small girl. She was white, but they beat her up because he wasn't, she wasn't listening. But I'm yeah. like, dude, seriously, overuse of power, big time. Um, yeah, yeah, but so- but it sorry, the, the, the tree. The tree uh, I was trying to. I was trying to make a point about horse trading. So yeah, um, the uh, basically neither party really wanted. There was a proposal to eliminate. Mm-hmm. I think Democrats, or at least some Democrats, proposed to eliminate um, uh, the uh, uh, immunity for police officers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Republicans. We're okay with that if we ended, it's not immunity, I should say, the, the our mandatory arbitration for police officers. Republicans were okay with that if we eliminated mandatory arbitration for teachers and all public employees, because Republicans want to fire allegedly bad teachers. Well, that's uh, a separate issue. We should put that on the separate, table another separate, time. First, talk about separate, one thing. Exactly. It's a yeah. separate issue. So the Democrats voted, I think neither party really wanted to end the arbitration for anybody, but the Democrats then voted against it because they were not willing to... Mm-hmm. Uh, and arbitration for all public employees. And the Republicans voted against it because they didn't want to end arbitration for police officers. Yeah. So what they, those are separate issues. We should have had a clean bill. Do we end arbitration mm-hmm. for police officers or not? We can have another clean bill. Do we end arbitration for teachers or not? And mm-hmm. maybe the third one, do we end arbitration for the rest of the public employees who aren't teachers or police officers? Yeah, or any other uh, government yeah, worker. Any other, yeah, any other government worker. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's an example of, of a bill. Now, what's arbitration mean as opposed to immunity? I thought they were the same interchangeable word. What, what's the difference? Oh, no. Our, uh, immunity means you can't be, you're immune. You can't be punished. So uh. Congress people, for instance, have immunity for what they say on, on the floor of Congress. So they can't be sued for, they can't be criminally prosecuted for what they say on the floor of Congress. And they can't be sued for libel or slander for what they say about somebody on the floor of Congress. Hmm. Um, so that's immunity. Uh, it's gener- generally, it would mean absolute. Arbitration means that the discipline goes before, before an arbitrator. So the, your boss wants to fire you. You don't want to be fired. You appeal to an arbitrator who is a supposedly neutral third party hmm. whose job is to be an arbitrator really Mm -hmm. on police, I don't know, I think public employee arbitration. And so there's, um, uh, uh, so so anyway, the arbitrator decides, Mm -hmm. but the arbitrator doesn't, for whatever reason, the arbitrators basically won't let you discipline police officers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Interesting. Well, that, you know, we put a lot of food on the table. And one thing I have, and we spoke a little bit just before we hit the go button on this uh, chat, was that many will will hear candidates out there that don't fall in the two buckets of blue and red, meaning Republican or Democrat, and say, oh, I love what they're talking about. I totally feel that they're on board with what's important to me, my values and what I want done in government. I just don't feel they're going to get in because they're not one of the two main parties. So I'm just going to vote for the two. Two of the lesser evils and yeah. and i keep thinking well that's nuts because then we keep getting the same thing over and over and over again if we keep saying the 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 people who aren't running in the two established main parties then we just get the same crap over and over again what what do you have to say about that particular mindset uh yeah i think that's true uh we've got we've got a what's called a first past the post system in the united states britain has it also where hmm. you um for each district, we, we want people, we want candidates into districts uh, or states or the entire, well, we don't really have an entire nation, even in the presidential election. But um, uh, if you win your district or, or the, with 51% of the vote, mm-hmm. uh, you get 100% of the power. Um, and the person that get 49% of the vote there, the people who voted for them have no representation effectively. And that person, that party has no power. So there's other, other jurisdictions, most of them in the world, really, I think, have proportional representation, where a party that gets 5% of the vote gets 5% of the seats in the mm-hmm. legislature, basically. Um, yeah. And uh, that's, studies have shown that's a better system. It's more stable. Uh, um, countries with proportional representation are more stable. They're less likely to have uh, the, the government overthrown, have coup, coups. Um, 
so in that I would support proportional representation. I would support ranked choice voting is another innovation that's been proposed where you would, um, and open primaries. Uh, so we don't have a primary in Republican and a primary in a Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, in the Democratic Party. We have an open primary, the top two or three or four candidates move on to the general election, mm -hmm. regardless of their party. Everybody votes in the same primary. Lisa Murkowski, I understand. I think Alaska has an open primary and it helped Lisa Murkowski to get elected despite her opposition to President Trump. So she would have had a hard time getting winning a, a pure Republican primary, but mm -hmm. with an open primary, she could win that. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, I would have open primaries and then ranked choice voting. And ranked choice voting, uh, I think there's a few ways it's done, but mm -hmm. you would rank the candidates one through three, four, whatever, mm -hmm. however many are on the ballot. And if first they count the first place votes, if everybody, um, if nobody got 50% um, in first place votes, they add your second place votes into your first place votes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then I think add the, if you're still not, nobody's still at 30, 50%, they then add the third place votes. Mm -hmm. um, so that, in um, uh, in my case, for instance, or many third party candidates, uh, if you wouldn't fear you were wasting your vote in voting for me and for, for first on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And if if it's a three person race, as I think this race effectively will be for me, um, I would probably be the second choice for everybody. I think yeah. <laughs> the Democrat. I would be the second choice for the Democrats for mostly, and I would be the second choice for the Republican voters mostly. Yeah. And uh, and if it's a reasonably equal outcome, I'd wind up winning with the second place votes as the the uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rank choice rank choice winner. So I, I that would be a. Open primaries and ranked choice voting would be a way to get less ideological candidates um, mm -hmm. um, more, um, and I think be a truer reflection of the of will the people. of people. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? I, I found in some of the third party, because I, I vote. I voted uh, many times for independent or outside of the two major party lines. Um, and for many years, you know, had down on my um, voting that I was an independent because I didn't want to be in a party. I don't want to be in a bucket. I want the person standing before me, whoever you are. I don't care how you call yourself. I want to know, are your values matching my values and what I care about? And you're going to do something about it, not just talk about it when you're up there. Um, but, you know, I. I think what I found interesting is that when it came time for debates and such, they would get little to no attention in the media. And of course, often they don't have the money power that some of the two big parties have. So they get almost no coverage. And so people be like, I didn't even know that person was running. So, I mean, I guess my call to action, I would be for anyone listening in today, if you'd like change is to really go purposefully look for who were the other parties running in the next elections, local, state, or government, uh, or federal, and say, I want to look deeper into them, not just look at what's coming up on TV commercials or radio, because you're only going to get the, the hugest ones, you know, throwing the most ads at you. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. I I'll say that was a great introduction for me to say, please donate to my campaign and, and to other third party campaigns, because people, as you said, people won't hear about us unless we can raise the money to, to run some ads and so on. And that that does take money. Um, and uh, and that's kind of a measure of how serious a candidate she are is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, where does everyone find out more about your candidacy? Donate. Um, also find out more about COVID lockdown and sanity. Where can they get a copy? I'd, lo I'd love for you to share all of that. Uh, please go to my web, my campaign website, which is McTavish, M-C-T-A-V-I-S-H, 4MN.org. Uh, MN is the abbreviation for Minnesota. Four is the number. Um, not, not the word, uh, but if you just Google Hugh McTavish for governor or McTavish for governor, you should be able to find that and then donate, please donate to the campaign, please. Uh, uh, cause it does, does take money. Um, uh, can I, can I just say one, one thing you, sure, you said was, uh, you about, um, oh, and the book is titled COVID lockdown insanity. You can get it on Amazon and, uh, Barnes and Noble, um, online or in Barnes and Noble stores and other stores. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, 
the, uh, oh, you were saying that you, you vote, the, the two parties don't really represent you. And I think mm -hmm. that's true for nearly all of us. We, <laughs> not very many of us agree with every position of the Democratic Party or every position of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And most of the things have nothing to do with each other. Uh, Republican Party, for instance, is anti-abortion, pro-life, and mm -hmm. supports a lower capital gains tax rate. Mm -hmm. Those have absolutely nothing to do with each other. <laughs> so why can't you support a higher capital gains tax rate and be pro-life? Uh, um, so, uh, but with the jury democracy, we would split, you're not voting, you're voting on just one issue. So, mm -hmm. you, and when with the elected representatives, we have to vote for one candidate or another, and you're kind of inevitably holding your nose and saying, I agree with candidate A on mm -hmm. six out of 10 issues. I agree with candidate B on four out of 10 issues. So I'm going to vote for, for A, but I'm not getting what I want on four of the 10 issues I care about. Mm -hmm. um, with the jury democracy, you can get what you want on every issue because you're voting just on that issue when you come in, when you come and serve on the jury. Yeah, and it would be really a great understanding for citizens to understand how our government works and maybe even get them involved in a local state level themselves. Um, yeah. There's so many different ways you can serve. Um, so I'm just so grateful, Dr. Hugh McTavish, for coming today to share your great wisdom. I'm grateful. I'm hoping you open the eyes to let citizens know they do have uh, the power in their hands to make change for their government and their life. Thank you so much for coming to Savvy Broadcasting. Thank you for having me, Christina. You betcha. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more Forbidden Speech or Savvy episodes, visit SavvyBroadcasting.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at LifeUnscriptedRadio.com.